Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires. And in this video I want to take a look at the differences in terms of starting position between Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empires for Kislev. I might do uh, another video like this for some other Legendary Lords, but I think Kislev is the most impacted by Immortal Empires. And this video is meant to showcase how. So we'll start with Catrin, who in Immortal Empires is the weakest by far of the legendary lords of Kislev, but in Realms of Chaos, she is actually the strongest by far and away. Now she still has the exact same problems that she does have in Immortal Empires in terms of her skill tree. She's not a good melee user, she's not a good magic user, but for all those issues, she starts in a much stronger position. See, here's what Creative Assembly changed. They removed one of the ice guards here and added a regular Kassar unit. So her army is actually weaker. And on top of that, the starting opponent that she has, and a starting opponent that will give her a thousand income, recruit and give her a Tempest Mage and 10 Devotion, is also significantly weaker to deal with. Because they only have two Marauders, one Marauder Hunter, and one Norska Norhound. Easily out resolved, even on the highest possible difficulty of Summer the entire game. Because this is on Legendary very hard. Now, that's already a fairly significant benefit, but it gets even better. See, Katrin has a bunch of quests that she'll get, a bunch of missions that she'll get very early on. One is send uh, send your new hero to join your army. Five hundred uh, five hundred there. Uh, then recruit two units. All that kind of good stuff. So Katrin is in an amazing position uh, over here to start really dominating all of Kislev. Now, she does have problems in this campaign. Don't get me wrong. She does have fraud trog to deal with. Yeah, you don't get. You don't get to escape the deadly combination of both Rot and Trog, though. Both Rot and Trog are significantly weaker over here. They still will send full stacks, or especially Frot will uh, send full stacks. And also we have the Pure Slings here who will send full stacks against you. But you're much better positioned to deal with them because you will have that significant economic benefit. And Kislev itself, as a city, will start at tier 2. So you can start uh, getting armored Kassars from the very beginning of your campaign. Uh, you can uh, start getting the Talo Keepers Guild. You can start getting a second army. Now, another thing to be said about Kislev in this kind of situation is they actually sit on in the middle of a major trade route Who calls? The Empire. and because of that cafe and caravans are gonna pass you uh, pass your territory you can also make these agreements with both the brotherhood of the bear and the drusian enclave like in immortal empires i would avoid uh, making any agreements with the Ostromar, because hey, you might want to wipe them out. Um, but you can start recruiting units uh, from turn one and get quite a few of them. While Katrin starts moving over to Gerslev, uh, Igorov, Forchikova, Volksgrad, and then Prague. Now, another significant benefit compared to Realms of Chaos is that Katrin can get Prague um, pretty quickly. Though she can do that in Immortal Empires as well, for either diplomacy or through military might. Seeing as you no start at war with Prague, you don't have to face the penalty, the devotion penalty of 100 devotion that you would get in Immortal Empires for declaring war on Prague, um, as you do in Immortal Empires. So you can gain Prague pretty quickly if you're playing Katrin. I mean, it is your natural expansion. You also can deal with these ogres, get a bunch of money. But here's the nail in the coffin. You can also get Erngrad very quickly, because here's what's going to happen in this campaign, especially on Legendary. Frat will wipe out the Drusina Enclave in the Northern Oblast. He'll take all of their territories. Now, Kostaltin will likely declare war on on Frat, sure, but um, and, and take some of these territories back. But by losing all those territories and the armies, 
the Drazina Enclave is going to be weak and significant. And because of that, they're going to be very willing to confederate with you. Now, the key to this is for them to become very weak, which they will, and for you to maintain your strength. And what that means is, in practice, is that Katrin can gain control of the three major Kieselite cities very quickly. You just need to ensure that you're not suffering major casualties. I've done a whole guide on how to secure Barsersus very quickly in, uh, in Realms of Cast for the sake of Immortal Empires. Uh, and it is very, and you can gain Erngrad within like 10, 15 turns or so. That's how quickly Front is going to weaken their armies. Provided you yeah. don't suffer any unnecessary, uh, unnecessary high casualties yourself. Like you don't need to expand like a maniac. All you really need to do is ensure that your armies remain strong, recruit a lot of units as quickly as possible. If you get lucky enough to get the Cafe and Caravan, that's great, though you don't necessarily need it. So, so Katrin, right the weakest, one of the weakest, most pathetic legendary lords in Immortal Empires, is actually the strongest Kislevi legendary lord in Realms of Chaos. And, and we go on further than that. And she's actually one of the strongest in the game as well. I'm not joking on that. The reason she's so strong is because she has the Ostermark, Osland, um, Sylvania, all ripe for the taking. And there's no opposition over here in this entire area. No major opposition. All the opposition is going to come from the north. Valkia, Krak uh, Valkia Trog, Frat, etc. But to the south, and a large portion of the uh, the West, there's no major opposition until you start uh, talking, uh, until you start talking about Scrag, and of course until you start talking uh, about Festus, who starts way over here. So until you get into that discussion, there's no major opposition facing Catherine, which means she can gain a huge amount of territory, build it up, get a huge economy. And that makes her incredibly powerful. Yes, she does have issues coming from North, but once she neutralizes those initial problems, maybe get some peace of agreements with the Beerslings or something along those lines, she can expand quite freely um, with no major opposition. For the moment, I'm sure that's going to change. I mean, the other choice would be it's Meow Ying, but Meow Ying's starting position is complicated, <laughs> to say the least. But that's Catherine. Let's move on to Castalton and then Boris Ursus. For Castalton, the situation is, in a lot of ways, far worse in Realms of Chaos than it is in Immortal Empires. Of all the Kislevite legendary lords, he's benefited probably the most from his new star position. I mean, Boris Ursus is the strongest in Immortal Empires, but Castalton, poor Castalton. He starts with Castle Alexandrinov, which isn't the proper capital. It can only go up to tier three. He is, and he does have poor relations with Erengrad, so technically you could take the view that you could declare war on them. The problem is, a declaration of war against the Kislevi faction would cost a hundred devotion, and you wouldn't want to do that right off the bat. Though, given the situation that Kostaltin has, where he is going to be fighting the Ungol Kindred with no Norskans like Katrin has, uh, then he is not, um, he is going to be in a relatively weak position. He does get the Patriarch early on after defeating this army, and he does start with an elemental bear. But that's where all the good stuff ends for Kostaltin. Another major problem for him is that he does have Trog to deal with, though. He can deal with Trog pretty quickly, take the lair of the Troll King, maybe make some deals with the Norskan factions. The problem is he's on the western flank of Kislev, and so he's very exposed to all the factions, the Demon Prince, Village. They're all very close. They're both very That's close it. to him, and they're both going to be a problem for you, on top of also Frat being a problem for you if you're playing Castalvin. Lord effects and faction effects do remain the same between Realms of Cast and Immortal Empires. Maybe some of them should be changed. Um, but Castalvin's position, his star position, is pretty awful in Realms of Cast, And he doesn't have a 
pretty good expansion path. And then, on top of that, even though he can technically get control of Prague pretty, uh, pretty early on, because he does have good relations with Prague, and let's say you can get control of Erengrad, he is going to miss control of Kislev for a large portion of the early campaign. Or actually for the vast majority of his campaign until he's able um, to confederate with Catherine, get the devotion. Now, I find that it's generally easier to get devotion with Castalotin than it is to gain devotion with uh, Catherine. Or at least, I guess the better way to say it is that Castalotin cheats far more when it comes to the devotion gain, uh, or to the supporter gain than Catherine does. I, I suppose it's because of his position that he has a lot of opponents and that contributes to him getting ahead when he's played by the AI. But when you're playing him, Catherine is going to generally be slower, both in Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empire. So you're going to do pretty decently well on supporters, but you're going to struggle because you're not going to be able to get the free capital cities as quickly as Catherine can do. I mean, Catherine at least starts at war with Erengrad, so she doesn't have to pay that devotion cost. So, I suppose you could take the view that you can evoke Urson and declare war on Erengrad very quickly. The problem is this army right here would march on you very quickly, just as quickly uh, in that situation. Probably better to wait until you can cast Urson a second time or until you've spent some of that early devotion and Erengrad has been weakened. You could also exchange some territory with Erengrad in exchange for getting in their good graces. Though overcoming the minus 70 historical relations deficit that you do have with Erengrad is going to be difficult. Catherine starts with good relations with Erengrad you don't. And it's even worse than that. The only faction you have any kind of good relations with is the Norland. And you don't want to make the deals with Norland. Uh, because as I've talked about when it comes to diplomacy, you don't want to make deals, even when natural allies, that your enemies, your natural enemies, are start at war with. Because the Demon Prince starts a war with Nortland. Like, if we look at Nortland, they start at war with all these factions. No promises to my ascent. Now, once these factions have wiped them out or weakened them, these factions are going to all declare war on you very quickly if you make deals with Nortland. So, you want to avoid... In fact, the best move you might do is actually declare war on Nortland yourself so that you can weaken them uh, so that uh, so that you can weaken them and make nice with the factions that they're at war with, so they're less likely to declare war on you. But all the same, Castalton's starting position is not particularly great. It's not the worst. It's not the worst, but it isn't a particularly great uh, position. But he can make it work, and he can capture two of the Kisawai cities. Prague, he can gain through confederation, because what's going to happen to Prague is Catherine is going to smash their armies, and eventually they'll be willing to bend the knee, so to speak, to you. So you can gain the very confederation, and you can gain Erngrad uh, pretty quickly, uh, as well if you do declare war on them. The you can't declare you war no on Catherine, and she can't declare war on you, so... Um, and that saves you some trouble when you do gain control of Prague, or you piss off uh, the uh, Drusina Enclave. But yeah, Castalton, pretty bad uh, star position. At least he does get the Patriarch fair, uh, fairly early on, and he obviously can uh, research Ice Sculpting to get the Frost Maiden and Piss Mage. Having good replenishment from the start of your campaign is actually very significant in a lot of ways, and uh, Castalton does have that going for him at least. Finally, there is Boris Ursus, who in Immortal Empires is the strongest legendary lord of Kislev by far. And the reason he's so strong in Immortal Empires is he is not limited by the supporter system when it comes to confederation, and he had some fairly substantial benefits as well from the supporter system, although they're only temporary benefits, but they are substantial enough. Like, if you support 
uh, Katrin, you get growth. If you support Castalton, you get control. The growth is very significant because it allows your settlements to grow this very quickly. And of course, he does have a war bear rider benefit, a Sargar benefit, construction time benefit, etc. So all that sounds really good. And he can colonize more types of terrain than either Katrin or Castalton can because he can colonize the wasteland, which means the dark lands are all for him. Here's the problem, though, in Realms of Chaos, because he is actually the weakest by far to play in Immortal Empire, uh, in Realms of Chaos, compared to Immortal Empires. Uh, he is great to get in Realms of Chaos, don't get me wrong, he is very strong in battle, and he does have some great lord effects, and he gives you diplomatic relations with Kislev, that free uh, colonization cost, etc., Grand Builder, all of those things are great bonuses. But here's the problem for Realms of Chaos, start position. For all the issues uh, Kostaltin has in Realms of Chaos versus Immortal Empires, where in Immortal Empires he starts with Erengrad, in Realms of Chaos he doesn't, for all those issues, uh, Kostaltin at least has access to Prague and Erengrad. Boris Ursus is very, very far away from them. He starts here in Zorn Uskol. Kislev is over here. Now, if you want to get control of Prague and Erengrad, and you can, by the time you get over here, Erengrad likely is going to be burned to the ground by the Skaven. Now, if you want to go over here, you're looking at a journey that's 20 turns, at least. And that's assuming you start heading right away after you've secured some territory here. My advice would probably be to take these free settlements and give this element to uh, Karak Azorn. Uh, trade it with them so that they'll f form a bulwark, but and then go deal with the Skaven because this all this territory, yeah, you guessed it, is held by Skaven, and they're gonna start raiding this. So you're very very far away. You're gonna be vulnerable to Valkia. You're gonna be vulnerable to a lot of enemies, and your arm, your starting Hi, army, it's good, sword. and the siege equipment, the little Grom, is actually very substantial, but lacking the armor costs are. Kassars, and in particular the Sargard that he does have in Immortal Empires, is a fairly significant blow to him. But the most significant blow is really the distance that he has to cover from here to Kislev. And look, if you're playing a Kislevite faction, Kislev in general is fairly weak. One of the significant benefits that they have in the campaign, though, is those special cities that they get. Prague in particular is very significant for uh, two reasons. Um, they have a structure... That, that gives them two major benefits. One, a global recruitment benefit, duration and global recruitment, so you can recruit the units faster in there. And it also gives you recruitment of Streltsy and armor and buff armor Kassars, which is a significant amount of power for one special structure. So you want to gain Prague, regardless of the uh, legendary lords, uh, regardless of the legendary lord you're playing. Erngrad also gives you some substantial benefits, Kislev itself gives you the least uh, benefits uh, if you're playing as Kislev uh, itself, but you want those cities. Now, Boris can confederate both Kostalten and Katrin much faster than either of them can with each other because he's not limited by the supporter system, he can just do it very, via regular diplomacy. Uh, but he's very, very far away in, uh, in Realms of Chaos, whereas in Immortal Empires, to give you a notion of how close he starts, he basically, um, as a comparison, he's essentially here uh, here in Immortal Empires in the Wharf. Like, that's the kind of distance we're talking about that he has to cover in Immortal Empires to get to Kislev, compared to all the way here. Now, it might not seem so significant, but remember, mountain terrain slows you down as well. And you don't have another way to do it faster as, say, the Dwarves or Skaven or Greenskins have. Or Wood Elves or Alifanar. For instance, you actually have to walk all the way there. You have to walk across the mountains. You've got a lot of foes to deal with, a lot of hostile ter uh, neighbors. You're isolated. You're strong. You have a good starting army. You do have, obviously, the quests, etc. But you also have a lot of problems. Um, furthermore, whereas Katrin gets a Tempest Mage, you get a useless mage, a useless Ice Mage. Which you're going to want to replace with the proper Tempest Mage once you do get that unlocked. But you do obviously have to research that to unlock that. 
I'm not sure what the developers were thinking giving him that, but I've played this campaign before and I can tell you, even Castalden for all his issues is a breeze complain compared to playing Boris Ursus. The difference between Boris Ursus in Realms of Cast and Immortal Empires, in Immortal Empires he just shows up with his powerful heavily armored army, takes out the Norskans in Frozen Landing, then marches to to help crack a drac, or he marches through Prague territory to deal with Frat, deals with Frat, takes help it, then helps crack a drac, and then he sells a lot of that territory to Castalton and Catherine, gets good diplomatic relations with both of them. Now, that's a plan you can follow through here. I do have a campaign where I did achieve that, but it is much slower going, and speed is essential, both in Immortal Empires and Realms of Cast. The reason speed is essential is the slower your campaign is, especially on a hard difficulty, the more time you're giving the AI to build up. And that's the key to victory. That's something you need to know. If you want to dominate in a, in a campaign like this, in either Realms of Cast or Immortal Empires, then you need to take as much territory as quickly as possible. Now, to be fair, you do have a, a lot of territory available, but here's the problem with Boris Ursus. Because he starts in the Darklands, he, the distance between settlements can be pretty large. Yes, there are free settlements that you can take pretty quickly, for if you count uh, this one from Skaven, but everything after, after that, including the mountains, because it's slower to traverse ter terrain in the mountains, takes you far longer, and it's also a nightmare to defend. You could technically expand to the south and take all of this territory because there's no one here to oppose it. But then you're gonna, then what's gonna happen is Kislev is gonna be burned to the ground by their many, many enemies. And you're gonna have to eventually march there to recover it. And you're also gonna miss out on the significant campaign benefits that you get from Prague in particular. So there are some fairly major issues with ignoring Kislev and having a campaign as Kislev away from Kislev and away from those juicy settlements. I think what Kislev needs, and in this I, I feel highlights one of the big issues for Kislev, I think what they need is for those benefits, I, I think the landmarks to an extent should be there. But I also think that some of that should be rolled into research. Because the problem with those special cities, it's not that just the structures themselves are so great. It's also you don't get access to some really amazing research if you don't hold those cities or an ally holds those cities. Um, uh, so, for instance, you're missing out on 15% ammunition all that. This is the problem, fundamental problem of Boris Ursus' campaign that he doesn't have in Immortal Empire. So, he's actually the one that got buffed the most. Katrin got screwed over the most. And Kostaltin, he still maintains that kind of middle position between the two of them. It's just a role uh, reversal between Katrin and uh, Boris Ursus, uh, between Realms of Chaos and Immortal Empires. Anyway, that's all there is to say. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications. And I'll see you boys and girls next time.